We are uh, in week two of a series we started last week called Overflow, and I'm really excited about what I I think God is going to do in our midst. So let's pray as we get into today and uh, discover what God wants to teach us. So Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for the things that you're doing in our hearts and our lives to draw us close to you. And I just pray as we study your scriptures today, as we study your word and, and get into the truths that we need to uncover, that we would just be drawn to you and really desire all that you have for us, God. So God, meet us in a special way today and just have your way in our lives. And we invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to reset something up for for later. (laughs) All right. So last week we started this series called Overflow and it really is something that has been on my heart as we get into this year that we begin to really live in the overflow of what God really intends for our lives. If you were here last week, hopefully you've been watching the words coming out of your mouth (laughs) and and really beginning to see where you're really at spiritually and maybe have a better assessment of where you're at with God because of that. And I think it was a really important message. If you missed last week, feel free to grab a CD again or listen online. But today we're going to turn our attention to living in the overflow. What does that mean to live in the overflow that God has for our lives? There's really many aspects of this. So much of this series is going to cover just different nuances of that. But I'm going to tell you so much of it is all connected to the Holy Spirit, which is what we're going to focus on today, is being connected to the Holy Spirit and Him being active in our lives. And in many ways, The Holy Spirit gets ignored in Christianity today, a lot of times, okay? We kind of know what to do with God. I mean, he's the big guy up there, right? And and so we we have this idea of who God is, that he's running it all and he's in control. We we learn all kinds of things about Jesus, right? And we study his life and we try to see what he did for us and what his work does in us. And so we focus a lot on Jesus. But when he gets to the Holy Spirit, we're like, well, I don't know what to do with that, you know? And and so often it gets ignored and we fall way short when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Like I said, last week we talked about this overflow that we need to be in. And I mentioned how so many of us, we're we're just giving out more than we're taking in. And so what happens is is eventually you run out of gas. And I, I, I referenced that so often many of us, what we do is we just get out and we start trying to push the car and we wonder why we're so exhausted. And really so much of this is connected to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is, is really what drives us spiritually or what should be driving us spiritually. And if we cut the Holy Spirit out of our lives, guess what? All that's left is us trying to trudge this Christian life out on our own. We're trying to do it and work it on our own, and we're powerless to do this on our own. And that's when the frustration kicks in. And let me just say this. If you're doing it on your own, you find out right now, you can look at your life and you say, hey, I'm feeling worn out. What that indicates is that there's a good chance the reason you're worn out is that you are doing it on your own, and you're not doing it in the power of the Spirit and letting God fill you back up every day in your life. So our key verse for today that we're going to study is John 7, 38, and it simply says this, the one who believes in me, as scriptures has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. Listen, the promise we see in this verse is that God has streams of living water that are supposed to be flowing in and through our lives out of us. And so think about how wonderful that would be. Wouldn't it be great if that's where you lived every day with the Holy Spirit flowing in and out of your life and flowing through you? For some of you today, the gift of the Holy Spirit and, and discovering what the Holy Spirit does is kind of going to feel like when, when you go and, and you put on that old coat that's been in the closet for a long time, and you reach in the pocket and you're like, hey, there's $100 here. <laughs> like, I hit the jackpot, right? And you're going to realize, you know, you had it all the time, but you haven't been utilizing it. And some of you are going to realize, wow, I've had the Spirit the whole time, and and it's going to be this wake-up call that you're going to experience something great. So let's unpack the implications of this great gift that God has for us in the Spirit. Listen, Jesus promised streams of living water flowing from deep within us 
and when he, when he, he talks about this, he, he brings it about in a dramatic fashion. And so we get that in the context. In John 7, 37, if we back up one verse, it says, On the last day and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. What is so important about the festival that we're talking about here and the timing of Jesus is, is really critical because Jesus really stands up and is being very strategic here during this festival. And you might not understand this, but a couple of years ago we did a series on the different feasts that Israel, Israel really kind of lives by and that they celebrate year in and year out. And this is one of those feasts. And so when it says on the last day of this great feast, it's referring to the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles wasn't just kind of this one day celebration. It was like seven or eight days of celebrating and worshiping God. And so it's interesting that Jesus is celebrating the festival as God had intended it. But listen, the Jewish people kind of added their own traditions to this. And so I find it very fascinating that Jesus takes their traditions and uses that to now illustrate his life and mission too. He's going to take some of their traditions that they added and say, hey, this is about me still. And so one of that was the special tradition that on the last day was known as the water drawing ceremony. You know, they would literally have this whole parade of worshipers led by the priests go to the pool of Siloam and they would celebrate. And the, the, the priest had two pitchers, one he had wine in and the other one, uh, he was getting water from that pool. And so it was actually empty. And so as they went on this pro procession, the flutes and the musical instruments would play and a choir would sing and chant Psalm 118, which is a psalm of thanksgiving. And the whole procession then heads back to the temple and through the water gate. Makes sense, right? It's all about water. And so at that point, a trumpet sounds and the priest enters the temple area and he, he takes those two silver or, or those two containers and he pours them into two holding tanks. And the one holding tank is where the wine goes. The other one is where the water goes from that pool of Siloam. And the whole ceremony was to thank God for the harvest. They're worshiping God because they've just brought in the harvest. But there's also this water element that they added because they knew that they depended upon God for rain. And so there was this drink offering poured out to God that he would provide rain for the next season. And so fast forward to Jesus. He's standing in the temple on this great day, going through this water ceremony of this feast, and all of a sudden he just stands up and in a loud voice he says this in John 7, 37, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. You see that this wasn't random. This was strategic. Jesus is crying out and getting their attention because, listen, their attention was on what? The water that they needed to live, and Jesus is saying, hey, I have the water you really need. It's not this physical water, it's the spiritual water, and I have that that you really need. It's similar to what Jesus did with, really with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, a few chapters earlier. When, when Jesus, this woman comes to the well at noon, his disciples went off and were getting some food in town, and Jesus, what does he do? He says, hey, can I have a drink of water? What is he doing? He's being strategic here. And she says this to him in verse 9, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You know, Jesus knew what he was doing. He was being very intentional. He was, he was pricking her appetite or her thirst to realize that she needed something. And so Jesus goes on and says this in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. I mean, look at this. Jesus goes from asking her for a drink to now offering her a gift of living water. And he's really pricking something within her that she didn't really realize she had until this moment. All of a sudden now Jesus had living water and she is coming to this awareness that I actually have this spiritual thirst that I have never had fulfilled in my life. So Jesus says this in verse 13 through 14, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. And she's like, let me have this water. 
I want that, right? This is exactly what Jesus is doing here in the ceremony. He's doing the exact same thing. He's like, hey, you have a spiritual thirst, and I am here to quench that thirst. The funny thing about thirst is that we often don't recognize when we're thirsty. You know, you can often get dehydrated, and you didn't know you were thirsty until it's almost too late. Most of us probably need to drink more water in life. If you really look at the water intake, most of you probably need more water in life. The recommendation is that we drink about a half a gallon of water a day, and probably most of us are falling way short of that. And listen, if you're working out or you're sweating, you should be drinking more because you're dispelling water. I remember when I was doing landscape work and, and there'd be some really certain hot days where I'd be working in the sun and there was a couple times where I got so dehydrated that I had to sit down and rest and keep drinking more water and then I'd get back to work and I just couldn't do it. I had to go home because I was so wiped physically because I just got wore out. And so I know what it's like to be so thirsty that you need water to function. And while that may sound simple that we need all this water, and we don't realize again how thirsty we really are. The same is true for us spiritually. I think most of the time we just don't know how, how spiritually thirsty we are for God until suddenly we, we just start to not feel right in life. Or maybe like it, it really is impacting how we're living we start seeing we're not living the way we should because we don't have the strength and the energy. I mean, I wanted to keep working in the heat. I just couldn't. I physically could not. And I think sometimes we get that way spiritually. And I really just love how God designed our bodies to often mimic what goes on to us on the spiritual level in our spiritual lives and to teach us those lessons. So here you have Jesus calling out, if anyone's thirsty, what's he doing here? He's actually creating a thirst or revealing that there's a thirst in you that you didn't know you have. Let me show you what I mean. You ever get like really thirsty in church? You know, like, just like, I really need some water. <sighs> How many of you are really thirsty right now? <laughs> just doing that creates almost a sense of thirst. I mean, advertisements know that, right? Right before a movie, what do they show you? Big, nice, ice-cold drink of pop, you know? Like, you need that now. <laughs> and you need some popcorn to go along with it. Why? Because they're trying to create a thirst. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's bringing your attention to a spiritual thirst you didn't even know you had until he brings it up. And then he shows you and reveals you, to you that, hey, you have this thirst. Now, we have to address something that often gets in the way with our spiritual thirst. And let me show you what I mean. In Jeremiah 2, 12 through 13, it says this, Be horrified at this, heavens. Be shocked and utterly appalled. This is the Lord's declaration. For my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cistern, cisterns that cannot hold water. Some of us Christians are committing a double evil with God. Listen, because we have experienced the fountain of living water in our lives. We've experienced that, and what have we done? We've abandoned it. Some of us have. And what's crazy is that when we abandon God, we still get thirsty. <laughs> you know that's going to happen? Thirst just doesn't get quenched because you say, I'm not thirsty anymore. No, you're still going to get thirsty. And so what do we turn to? We, we turn to creating our own cisterns that can hold water that we can go back to, that we can draw from. And the problem with that is, is that cistern is not living water, which means that water, if it doesn't get used up after a certain time, guess what happens? It grows stagnant and it's, it will make you sick. But on top of that, our best means of creating a cistern is broken has all kinds of holes that even the water we're trying to store seeps out. And so what does it mean? It means we become more dry. And so it, it's cracked and it leaks. In other words, when we turn from God to the world, the world just can't quench our thirst. You try, but it never works. Let me tell you this, more money, it won't quench your thirst. A new house, guess what? Not gonna quench your thirst. A new boyfriend or girlfriend, not going to quench your thirst. 
new adventures in life, while they may seem fun for a moment, not going to quench your thirst. In fact, do you know what pursuing the world often is often like? Eating crackers. You know what happens? You eat a mouthful of crackers. What do you just sucks all the moisture out of your mouth. And you become more and more thirsty. And I want to tell you, no amount of worldly crackers will satisfy your thirst. It's only going to make you more thirsty, and in essence, for the real thing, hopefully. Hopefully, what happens for many of us, we become so dry that finally, finally, we want what God's offering. Finally, we, we become so thirsty, we need God. And that is what Jesus is doing here and why what he does here is such good news because he is revealing to us our thirst and then he gives us an invitation. He says this in verse 37, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. Jesus stands up and brings us to a place where we can see now, hey, I am thirsty. I have this spiritual thirst, but we may not have noticed it before, but now that we do, he goes another step further. He gives us an invitation. Hey, come to me. And I'm so glad that God doesn't just show us where our need is. He invites us to have that need met in him. He doesn't just reveal us our need. He invites us now, I'm going to meet that need. But it doesn't leave, it kind of really leads me with a question that I've been wrestling with all week as I've been studying this. And it really is this. When God points out my need, so many times I'm hesitant to turn and run to him for the needs that he wants to meet. And the question is, why am I so hesitant? Why is it that I resist God's invitation? I don't think I'm the only one. Jesus is great at giving invitations. And let me walk through a couple of these. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, he says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Most of us read that, we're like, that is a wonderful verse. <laughs> it's so encouraging, right? But most of us know times, there's so many times in our lives where we're what? We're thirsty, we're, we're weary, right? We're carrying heavy burdens. And what do we still do? We don't come to God. Why? Let me give you three th- reasons why I think we don't heed the invitations that Jesus offers us. The first is pride. I mean, many of us, we believe that pride is both good and bad, right? It's bad, in, in essence, when you use it to uh, look down on others. Obviously, that's bad, right? And most of us would look at that. So pride, when you look down on others, is bad. But at the same time, sometimes we act like pride is good when we use it to work harder so that we don't need anybody else's help. And that's pride, too, because guess what? You've just elevated yourself above the need to be helped out. Like you just said, I don't need anybody. And God says differently. And this has huge spiritual implications as well. Listen, I tend to fall into this kind of pride more than the other because I grew up with a strong work ethic. My, my, watch my dad, you know, when, when you struggle, you just work harder. And that's really what he taught me. But really, this kind of messes up our lives in a spiritual sense because working harder often gets in the way of what we need that can only be filled in God. What we need in God never comes from working harder. Do you realize that? God never says, hey, this is what you need to do and you need to work harder to get it. He never says that. And when we're tired and working harder, it leads to us becoming what? More tired and worn out. And what's amazing is is that those of us who are tired and worn out, we heap on top of that, we're guilty about being tired and worn out. James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Listen, we don't normally connect that our exhaustion and guilt are often an indication that we're walking in pride. But God says, hey, calm. What you have, I, what you need, I have. But if we come to God, what does that mean? I had to humble myself. James 4.10 says this, though, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. It is in humility that you and I, guess what? We find grace. It's in humility that actually we find God moving in our lives and lifting us up and exalting our lives out of the weariness, the dryness, the frustrations, the burdens, the weir- all of those things. God lifts us up out of that because we've humbled ourselves and received from him. 
And so it may be that we are walking in pride that is keeping us from the invitation that Jesus has given us. Well, let me say this. I have a $10 bill right here. First person that comes up here, it is yours. <laughs> Only one person is moving. <laughs> Now I'm thirsty. <laughs> Listen, the second reason many of us don't respond to the invitation of Jesus is because honestly, we didn't think he really meant us. We read the invitation as somebody else that was given to, but not me. And so we don't respond. But the invitation's to anyone. I said, anybody who wants this, come on up. Only one person moved. Anyone includes you. Let me be clear, about, because I think sometimes we have these doubts about this anyone thing. In Isaiah 55.1, we read this, Come, invitation, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. And you without money, what? Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. How can you buy something if you don't have money, Right? In other words, the invitation goes out to come and the person's thinking, well, it doesn't mean me because I can't afford it. I don't have any money to come. So I must be excluded. But God says, nope, come anyways. Because listen, it's not that you need to give me anything. I have what you need. And so I want you to come because I am going to meet that need. All you have to do is receive it. And so this is the second reason is we just don't include ourselves. The third reason that we don't come is that we don't believe him. Or in a spiritual term, we lack faith. Jesus says this in John 7, 38, the one who, what, believes in me, as the scriptures have said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. It is the one who believes in Jesus that will experience this overflow of water in their life that will quench their thirst. Why? Because God rewards faith. He does. He simply wants us to reorient our lives to trust him. And when we do that, he rewards us. Look what he says in Hebrews eleven six. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Listen, so many of the invitations of God are not vague rewards. He tells us exactly what he's going to do. If you trust me, I'm going to do this for you. And yet, what do we still do? I don't believe you, God. I don't believe you. And God is very clear. He says, hey, if you come to me, I'm going to give you rest. I don't believe you, God. We just don't trust him. And because we don't trust him, we don't receive the reward. Now, let me pause and ask a question. What have you believed God for in your life? Listen, for some of us, we believe God for getting us out of hell and into heaven, and that's a pretty good start. <laughs> Others of us, we believe God, he forgave my sins and he gave me a, a new life, so I have a new start on everything. But we often stop trusting God for the many other things he says he has for us. And one of those critical areas that we often stop trusting God for is the Holy Spirit. But why? I think it gets back to our lack of understanding the place that the Holy Spirit is to play in our lives. Many of us have believed actually a whole lot of lies about the Holy Spirit than what Scripture has taught us about. You know, like how the Holy Spirit's kind of weird? That's a lie. It really is. I mean, there are a ton of Christians who I'm weirded out by the Holy Spirit thing. It's just a lie. Or the Spirit doesn't move today like he did in the past? So, you know, we need to be careful about the spirit thing. It's a lie. Can I just be really bold and say that these lines of thinkings are lies from the devil to keep you from the power that God has for your life? Look at what Jesus himself said about the Holy Spirit. I mean, let's go to Jesus. This is what he says in Luke 11, 11 through 13. What father among you, if his son asks you for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks you for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, messed up people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Whoa, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is 
is this great gift that God has for us. And Jesus wants to know that. And he says, listen, the way you get it is simply by asking him and receiving it. And so this is the work he wants to do in our lives. And so let's look at this promise. John 7, 38 through 39 says this, the one who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. And then he go, went on to say, that this is about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit has not yet been received because Jesus had not yet been glorified. The promise is given to, to these disciples while Jesus was on this earth. And so it was a promise for the future, like someday the Holy Spirit's gonna come in your life. That promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And ever since the day of Pentecost, then, every single person who is a believer in Christ, who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you are his child, you now have received the Holy Spirit in your life. So if that's true, that every believer has the Holy Spirit living inside of them already, why is it that we're still dry and we're still worn out and weary? You know, as I was praying this week, that's a question, again, I asked the Lord. If streams of living water are meant to be flowing through my life, and I feel a struggle to feel like I have this power of God flowing through my life, what's going on? Why is there the struggle? And I really have come to believe that a big part of it is that, if I'm being really honest, I'm not thirsty enough. So I'm not drinking enough of the Spirit for me. And if I'm not thirsty for the Spirit, then I'm not going to be filled with the Spirit. I know that might sound weird to some, but let's look at a couple other verses to kind of show us what God intends for our lives with the Spirit. Let's start with this one. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. Quench is a weird word in the dictionary because you look it up and you know what quench means? It means on one hand to satisfy and then on the other hand, to extinguish. Almost seems like opposites, right? In this verse, it, it literally means to extinguish. And so we don't want to extinguish the Spirit of God in our lives, but we do want to satisfy our thirst for Him. Now here's the problem with many of us. We keep extinguishing the Spirit of God in our lives. And it's often not in ways that we might think of. Because I think the first way we extinguish the Spirit of God in our lives, most of us understand and know. And the very first way is you extinguish a fire is what? You pour water on it. And I think we can very clearly see that when we sin, it's like pouring water on the Spirit in our lives. And we're quenching the Spirit of God when we sin in our lives. So we kind of get that. But we don't get the second way. And some of us, we're just not living dominated by sin, but we still feel like the Spirit of God is quenched in our lives. It's because there's a second way to extinguish a fire, and it's simply this. Let the fuel burn out. If you don't add more fuel to the fire, the fire is going to go out. And some of us, the reason why we're quenching the Spirit is we're not adding fuel to the fire of our lives, and therefore the Spirit is dying out. We must keep adding fuel to the fire. So how do you add fuel to the fire? Jesus told us, again, in his invitation in verse 37, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. Right? Come to me. Listen, you have to drink. It's kind of funny. Because if I don't open my mouth and take in the water and then swallow it, what's going to happen is my face might get wet. <laughs> If I don't swallow it, the inside of my mouth gets wet. But listen, inside, I'm still dry. It never went to the core of me. And I know it sounds simple, but many of us, we're, we're not drinking of the Spirit. And we're not letting it get to the core of our lives. And that leads us to the second verse. Ephesians 5, 17 through 18 says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled with the Spirit. Listen, we're often drinking from other things. But we are told to be filled by the Spirit. It's interesting that other translations say with the Spirit. So what's going on there? There's a lot here to unpack that we can learn from a grammar lesson, so I'm going to try to make this uh, appealing, not just like, you know, academic. 
But listen, in the original language, it's written in a tense that means we're to keep on being filled continuously. This is a continuous action. Be filled. It's a continuation. It's constantly supposed to be happening in our lives. And, and that's where we're supposed to live, constantly being filled by the Spirit. The second part of this, though, is, is that the filling part is passive. And what that means is this. You're not the one filling yourself up. There's an outside force filling you up, which is God, of course. So God is the one filling us. But listen, it's also in the context of a command. Be filled with the Spirit. So how can you be commanded to do something that you're not doing? Because the only way you can do this is if you participate with the work of what God is doing. We're commanded to receive, in essence, the filling of the Spirit consistently in our lives on a daily basis. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. God's already doing it, but are you receiving it? So what does being filled with the Holy Spirit mean? Well, it actually doesn't mean getting more of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Because God didn't just give you some of the Holy Spirit and said, hey, if you do a little bit more, you work a little bit harder, I got more for you. He didn't say that. And so we get confused about this, and it really can, can challenge us in how we approach God. So let me explain it this way. The Bible says that God is love. He's fully love. There's no degrees to God's love, which means you can't get him to love you more or less. God just loves. That's who he is. But guess what? You and I, we can experience varying degrees of God's love in our lives, right? It doesn't change who God is, but it changes what changes is our experience of that love. And the same is true with the Holy Spirit. We have all the Holy Spirit in our lives, but our experiences of the Spirit vary from person to person. Can I just say, God wants us to know fully His love as much as we can take. God wants you to know fully His Spirit as much as you can take. He wants you filled with these things. And so being filled with the Holy Spirit actually means that we're continually controlled by the Spirit of God in our mind, our emotions, and our will. We all need more of that experience in our lives, right? Which is really in a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. We all need to experience more of our lives being dominated by the Spirit's control. So letting the Spirit fill you and lead you is not about a whole bunch of Christians walking around out of control because they have the Spirit of God in their lives. It's actually a whole bunch of Christians walking under the dominance and control of the Spirit who's loving and doing great, powerful things in and through our lives, flowing through us to other people, deep inside of us, rivers of living water flowing out. Listen, as we close today, the invitation again is to everyone. But listen, the Holy Spirit is only given to those who believe. All the good things that we have talked about today can only be received if you have received Jesus. And if you receive Jesus, guess what? You get the Holy Spirit. So his invitation, come to me, leads us to the most important spiritual thirst we have, which is to be in a restored re relationship right with God. And only he can satisfy that thirst. But listen, he always gives us a choice. Listen, this is a serious moment because if you have never received Christ as your Savior, today you have a choice. You can either receive him or reject him. Let me just be very clear though, you cannot be indifferent to him. Indifference to God is rejection of God. And I point that out because some people will, will think, oh, I've never rejected God, I just haven't received him. But that is still rejecting God. And I hope you see just through this story of what we've been studying today, the one thing that stands out to me is how much Jesus is constantly trying to draw us to him. He's an inviting us, hey, come to me. I have what you need. And there's this invitation constantly for us, if you're thirsty, come. And my challenge today is, is that as we go into a, a time of closing today, that if we, if we need Jesus, we come to him. And so we're going we're gonna to close in, in really just one way. I mean, we're, I'm going to 
give an opportunity for people to come to salvation. But then we're just going to go to God and worship. And we're going to open up the altars. And if you want prayer, we're going to pray for you. If you just want to kind of get alone with God and His Spirit, I mean, I want to leave room for that because some of us just need to get alone. You can do that at your seat or you can come to the altar. I mean, we're going to do the left side right here or my left is just a, a, an opportunity for you to get alone with God. And on the right, if you want prayer, we'll have some people up here ready to pray for you over here on the right. But if that'll just be between you. But let's seek God for a few moments. Are you thirsty today for more of his spirit? And if you are, he's going to fill you. And I just believe more than anything, we need a spiritual encounter with God today um, to just fill us up, fill us to overflowing, to really tap into this wonderful gift that we have. So let me close in prayer, and then we're going to go into this time of worship and just in the presence of God. God, thank you for today. Thank you for what you're teaching us, God. I pray that, Lord, there would just be a hunger and a desire in our hearts for more of you. God, you've pointed out in many of us that we are thirsty and that we have this spiritual thirst. God, you point that out because you have what we need. I thank you that you always have what we need. And so I pray today as many of us are dry, many of us are weary, many of us are worn out, that we would heed the invitation today to just come and let your spirit fill us to overflowing, God. God, for those that are struggling to have faith to believe that you're true to your word and what you say you're going to do, God, may we, may we just be infused with this faith to trust you and to believe and to step out, even though we may still have doubts. And I thank you for the work you're going to do. Listen, before we worship, if you're here in this room and you've never received Christ as your Lord and you know today you have an invitation, Jesus has come to me. And you can either receive or reject him, but, and the choice is yours. But God has invited you and he's told you that if you come to me, I'm going to give you a new life. It's not vague what he wants to do. He wants to completely transform your life today. And if that's you today, can I just lead you in a prayer? Just between you and God, would you just pray with me? Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, God. But today I hear your invitation to come and to receive you as Lord and Savior of my life, God. I thank you that the promise is that you would put me in a right relationship with you, O oh God, and I could begin walking with you, Jesus. But I also thank you for the promise of your spirit that would come and live inside me and begin working in and through me, God, to draw me closer to you and your ways and the things of you, O oh God. And so, Lord, I invite everything you have for me, God, and I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen.